thank you so much for the very warm welcome. And let's get started. And the beginning is actually you have it on you, with you. We have all these amazing devices, which we are very good in creating. Joysticks, computers, AR headsets, VR headsets. The first one actually appeared before the first mainframe computer, uh, very first prototype. And they're getting smaller and smaller and closer and closer to our bodies. For example, this Apple Watch, you might wear some other ones like Fitbit. And obviously, as close as they're getting to us, they're getting into our lives. But I would argue throughout this talk that they're not always helping us to thrive and to live. So what would be a solution? For the past 11 years, I'm actually working on one. We call this brain-computer interfaces. There is a lot of different terms to it. But ultimately, we are trying to create interface that can actually read your brain activity. We can analyze it, understand it, and then use it as a command for the system. Obviously, it's slightly less, uh, more complicated than it sounds. And in this talk, I will actually not only talk about brain activity, but in general, bias signals. So just wanted to highlight this one because in the literature, BCI is always stayed for brain computer interfaces. But throughout my talk, I'll actually refer to bias signals. Why I'm going to do this? Well, because we are an amazing working network of signals. This is just an example of our head. So if I'm going to put sensors on your forehead, or for those who have little brains, you can actually pick up the brain and look at just this part of the brain. We can pick up attention, engagement, cognitive load if you're struggling with the task. If I'm going to put sensors here on the back of the head, it's called visual cortex. We can pick up when you're thinking about some objects. For example, right now, I just realized that I forgot to get some coffee. So I'm actually was thinking about getting it, but then I saw, <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's almost mental control here. <laughs> So, but I was also actually thinking, oh, do I have time? I'm not gonna like, be just in front of people listening to me just drinking my cup of coffee. So we can pick up if I'm thinking about this cup of coffee, literally. I'm gonna give you examples of Starbucks and Blue Bottle later on. And um, if you're gonna go down actually around the eyes, eyes are extremely powerful part as well. You might know about eye tracking. That's a term that usually stands for and you track the positioning of your eyes also your pupil dilation. But there are ways to do this with and without the camera. Just an example, if I'm gonna ask you, thank you so much, if I'm gonna ask you, can you tell me someone how much will be 325 and 1075? And you might be able to give me the answer, but some of you might struggle, which is totally fine. So at the moment you're gonna struggle, your pupil is gonna dilate, it's gonna get bigger. And in some moment when you're like, Okay, she has a calculator, I'm not gonna give you an answer, whatever. It will shut down super fast. So we can literally say when you're about to in get engaged in the task, when the task is too hard for you, and then when you're about to abandon it, even before you're gonna tell us, okay, I don't really know, whatever. Obviously, our whole head and the whole body is covered with skin. And um, we call this skin conductivity, so uh, this is another very powerful signal where we can actually pick up your stress level, arousal, et cetera. Obviously, nose, actually, it's the tip of the nose. If you measure the temperature between the tip of the nose and your forehead, uh, we can actually say also how overloaded you are with information. Like sometimes you might know that, oh, it's actually cold. So yeah, basically we can pick up this information. So a lot of different interesting, powerful things we can get out of uh, our and this is just the head. I'm not going to even go down, because if I will go down, that will be the end of the stock. I'll be like, thank you, questions. Yeah, I will try to basically get and keep it to the head, particularly to the brain. So um, once again, don't put all the references here. This is what I mentioned, heart rate and skin and eye movements and brain and temperature. This is attention, cognitive load, engagement and fatigue, what we can pick up. The one that stands for green cross are very validated in the literature, a lot, a lot, a lot of research. The ones that are standing for the Red Cross, either they're just popping up or not really validated. It's very important here for the scale. If you, I see that you are taking picture and I don't have any support. So when you're gonna look at this picture at home, this is all individual scale. 
meaning not the general scale, because there is a very big difference when we will look at you as a whole, as a crowd, versus when you're going to just look at me and my data. So this is very important. When you're going to look at the literature, you're actually studying the subject, always mind the gap, and there is a very nice set of research talking about this. So I would definitely uh, share those with you if you're interested. So we mostly might are going to focus on the brain, but definitely we're going to also touch a bit on the eyes. And once again, uh, we're gonna, we can talk offline about other ones. So today, it looks like this. I don't know if you've ever tried to use any brain sensing tag. Usually you look like octopus, like on the second image up there. They're usually bands, so, but we try to improve the form factors. We try to make it something like earpieces embedded in the helmets, because you figured out it's about the head. Still needs to be, have connection with the head, so that's very important, but we are working on it. But it's still a long way to go. But even if you have never tried, and I invite you to contact me if you want to test, to be a test subject in the experiments, you might have definitely seen these ones. And that's where we are actually heading. Uh, implants. Uh, little uh, tattoo-like electrodes and sensors, hair-based sensors, everything that can still get close, but potentially even invisible. And this is ultimately the most powerful solution there. Uh, for example, I have an implant, but you definitely don't see it. You don't even know which body I have an implant in. Uh, it is in the head, actually. But it can give a lot of information. And more importantly, you do not know that you have this enhancement. Or maybe it's an ability that needs to be restored. So before we dive into the subject, I just want to say that obviously along my 11 years of working on these projects, did a lot of different setups. I, I, was, I used brain activity to, for robotic control, uh, for priming. Priming is a fancy term and uh, for neuromarketing. Uh, which is another term to, you know, when you see something like, uh, and we're gonna then change, give you another stimuli to change your perception to the initial stimuli. For example, you, I would tell you, oh, I love your red sweater. You look so amazing, so gorgeous. It really pumps up your eyes. And then five minutes later, I will ask you, can you give me an Uber ride, please? It's such a bad weather. <laughs> chance that she's gonna tell yes, it's very, very, very high. And yeah, I don't even mention anything initially. I prime her in positive way, giving her positive terms. So that's what you use in priming. But you can use this and you can pick this up in brain activity. So implicit ways, implicit responses. That's used a lot in, in marketing. LS patients, I do work a lot with those. We're not gonna unfortunately mention this subject. It's a very interesting topic. So if you want to talk or you have a family member who is interested, definitely uh, speak to me offline. I'm doing a lot of AR, VR work. Obviously, as you can imagine, because there's uh, HMDs as well, they're definitely very relevant for sports and pilots training and learning. And the two that we actually gonna talk about are these two. Uh, this pair of glasses where I look pretty funny and ridiculous and that starting head over there. So, as I mentioned at the very beginning, all these devices are extremely powerful on our perception, cognition, what we see, how we see the things. But I would actually argue that they control us right now and not otherwise. That's why this little brain over there is so small. But on top of this, we are paying a price. Mental health issues, we all suffer to them in, to some extent. Maybe not calling this as a disease, but we definitely pick up the phone, we have this phone, we have these notifications, we go and check our Facebook, our messages each time. This is a closed loop reward system. A lot of people know how this works, but they still live with it. And it takes your time, your attention, your performance, the time from your family, from your work, from what actually you like and what m can make you happier in your life. So in this project I'm gonna talk about first, uh, we are trying to see if we can get back the control to the brain. And to do this, <laughs> strangely, we actually design something, a device, but it's slightly different from uh, the others that exist out there. I'm gonna explain to you. So just to full disclaimer, I'm not into idea of the projects 
let's design something fancy, device number 3045. No, let's first, if you have any hypothesis, check if it actually works. And I think this is how it should be done in general, especially in science, especially in research. So what we have done, you might know that there is a lot of different uh, bands out there. They're pretty cheap. You might have heard about some of them. These bands, which you can see on my head, it's a pretty dark picture, or on the mannequin head over there, they're usually about two, three hundred dollars. They have several sensors. You can pick up your meditation levels, your engagement levels, and they're very affordable. And most of the labs do have those. Because the price range of any BCI-based device is usually up to 50,000, so you can imagine 200 is really very affordable. You can have it and even play around with it. It's very basic in the sense that you need, it's in full disclaimer for those who are um, just entering this level of physiological data, this cannot read imagination of your, uh, of your Starbucks bottle or something like that, but definitely can give you some insights and some data with some precaution. It's a very nice uh, basis of literature about this. So what we have done, we've just taken this existing device of the shelf and we said can this device be good enough to pick up when we are engaged and not engaged with our task for example you might be looking at me right now but actually you're also thinking i need to head out to that coffee it smells really good and so you are socially engaged with me you are actually mentally not engaged with me at all so the question was can we pick it up with this kind of very light system very cheap very relatively cheap very accessible, you can just go right now online and buy it. And if we can, what would we do with it? What if we can give you actual feedback when you're not engaged? Like, because it sounds that, oh, I know when I'm paying attention, not paying attention. Actually, brain activity is usually not self-revealing. It's sometimes hard for you to tell when exactly you lost the track of something. And even if you can say this, it's usually Sometimes a lot of people just lose the track. You're like, I lost the track of time. I lost the track of my attention. I'm like, oh, 20 minutes passed. I was actually, I just missed a half of the lecture. So what we did is we did a very simple thing. We just took a very simple piece of cloth and we just added to this simple, simple cheap Arduino two motors. So basically the idea was in this scarf-like thing, so we just to cover the electronics within it, we will put two motors that will vibrate each time we detect that you are not engaged with your task on hand. So basically just covering this up. And it looks like this. So this is a non-photoshopped, just a picture taken, and though it's pretty dark, you can see, for example, here, you can see the band, so you can see that people are wearing it, but you can barely see the scarf, it's just here, for example. The idea was, if it works, it can be embedded in like a sweater, in any kind of clothes, an actual scarf. So just make people wear something that fits on all of them so they all feel equal when we actually run the test. This is very important, especially in the learning environments, and I will come back to this. So what we did is we did a study. We did actually a set of studies with this very first uh, version. So we did uh, something that we call in literature neurofeedback or accurate feedback. So basically we were providing people with the feedback sky was vibrating with those two little motors each time that we detected that people were not engaged in the lecture that they were listening to. Second was random feedback. What if just the presence of the device would be enough? You know, like, for example, this dress was gifted to me uh, by my boyfriend, so each time I put it on, I feel so much more empowered and nice and happy to see him. We have this attachment to the objects. It's extremely strong, actually in most of people. So maybe just the presence of something that I call smart, fancy, cool device that will read your mind would be actually enough. That can happen. Moreover, it will actually vibrate from time to time completely randomly. So it would be like, oh, I, I'm pumped up. Like, you know, like notifications, pretty straightforward. And then ultimately no feedback, just the presence of the device itself. In addition to this, because you saw the setup, so gonna go back to this one more time, these were all MIT students in the actual lecture hall. So what happened here is that uh, they saw that some people are wearing, some people are not wearing. If this happens, especially in actual setup, not in controlled setup where it is controlled, they find the consents, they're all adults as you can see, they can be bullied. And this is very strong 
tests in particular in with minors, particularly in the actual schools, particularly in some environments. That's why even if you do this kind of test, we need to make sure that everyone is equal. So there is no question, why are you wearing this thing? You look ridiculous, okay. Oh, I also wear this thing, I also look ridiculous. So at least you roll this out, but this is super important actually. It sounds funny, but it is very important when you try to test these kind of systems. So what happened is that we collected, uh, they were uh, going through three lectures, one lecture a week. We designed this lecture with an um, actual professor who was giving the lectures uh, on VR, and we collected a lot of different data. The responses to the questions about the content of the lecture, so in the very end, they didn't know, but they actually had questions uh, to ask about the content of the lecture. They exclusively about the content of the lecture. They do not rely on any previous knowledge. We had a lot of different things, the subjective scores, objective scores, different things that we have collected. Very importantly, we spent quite a time to design the actual lectures, the actual slides. So uh, I'm gonna actually start with this one. What we did is, each lecture was 40, 50 minutes. We divided it in clusters of slides, like 10, one to 10, uh, 21 to 30, etc. Each cluster was corresponding to something that we called interesting, boring, misleading, wow. In the sense that there was one piece where we had a video of uh, Elon Musk. Attention level of everyone went to like 90%. It was also a funny video. We had a part of the video, uh, where, of the lecture, where actually we asked the professor explicitly put a lot of formulas, doesn't mean the formulas are bad, but a lot of formulas that you do not explain, like at all. Not a single connection, you're like, okay, here you go, this is the concept, next slide. So, okay, one slide, you can keep up. Two slides, you can still keep up. But <laughs> five, six slides in a row, you're gonna be like, okay, he, she that doesn't explain anything, I cannot follow because you cannot follow because it's a long lecture. Even if there is some interesting stuff, there will be definitely moments where you need to learn something, you need to be engaged, and if we are doing it hard for you, you're not gonna collaborate with us and actually stay engaged. So this was the ways of for us to also control a bit for the environment. And I'm not sure where the animation went, but uh, I can tell you what were happening. So basically, each point is the point that we picked up as the uh, point where uh, one slide's um, attention was dropping. So at each time for the blue line, we were providing the feedback to the users. Hey, this was the people who were getting accurate feedback. So each time they had a feedback, uh, the attention went up, the engagement went up. For the random, it was red, so which was sometimes vibrating, sometimes not vibrating. And for the gray, there was no feedback. So they were just wearing the device. And another one uh, I think is also interesting is to show the progression of the answers after uh, each lecture. So the blue one, once again, stands for the people who got uh, accurate feedback. So it was vibrating when the system detected they are not engaged. With, uh, green one stands for uh, random and red for no feedback. So basically we can see that on the scale of 10, uh, our users who get accurate feedback responded better. Once again, these questions were based exclusively on the content of each lecture. Here it was already for three lectures. So just give an example how it actually works. When we ask them, I don't think I have time to play the recordings, but we recorded each user, their actual responses, how he or she perceived it. Uh, and what happened is that they said that I actually in some moments remembered that it was vibrating. So I actually remembered, oh, this question, Oh yeah, I remembered it. So they basically were taking it from the memory. So it was very nice. Uh, obviously, it was very interesting when because the setup was for three lectures. So uh, some users told us, oh, I was really, really very tired. This lecture didn't really caught me because the previous one, I was actually very engaged. It didn't vibrate, maybe that's why it didn't vibrate. But uh, actually, maybe that was the reason why it worked. So uh, that was a very interesting setup. But definitely, um, it's a classroom-based setup. So we thought, what if we can see how it happens more in personalized setup? <laughs> Which usually, I guess, me, I'm doing this very often, but I'm pretty sure you also all do it, when you just watch a video. So this was with an actual lecturer, with a group of your peers, 
you were attending to physical lecture, coming over to this physical lecture. Here, you have uh, also three lectures, but they are actually video lectures. Uh, so we were having uh, lectures on neural networks, on bitcoins, uh, and um, I don't remember the third one. I think it was on the uh, DNA. So what happened in those ones is that we obviously collect information from the users. Do you know the subject? Do you think it's interesting? Can you follow it? Once again, they were actually self-containing, so there were no there were specific terms, but to each lecture. And also the idea was that you can answer the questions uh, that are only exclusively based on the content of the lecture. And once again, they were, in this case, each getting each three types of feedback during each of the lecture, meaning that in that case, in the previous one, we had three groups of users and they were assigned the feedback. In this one, we would say, we have one person. Will he or she actually understand what's happening? Figure out what is what, where is random, where is no feedback, because sometimes people actually think, oh, it vibrated when it, when it did not vibrate. And will it actually, after they had the whole experience, tell us that it ultimately helped? And obviously, we want to see also objectively, not just subjective perception of the users. So it looks like this, pretty straightforward as we do it at home. I mean, this was in the lab, but it looks like you're just sitting in front of the computer and you are uh, listening to the lectures. So we collected uh, the same information and the same thing happened. Uh, so the correspondence of the colors is the same. In blue one, we had the user response, uh, what is how they perceived it was accurate or not. And also what is more importantly here, this is the engagement score of the users. So in blue is the engagement score of the users uh, who were getting accurate or nervous feedback. So it was a very nice set of experiments. It was like 48 unique subjects. I say unique because some subjects actually got back from the first lecture set of lectures. They actually got back to say, oh, we want to do more. I was like, oh, that's great. As they were, I was like, maybe they actually hated it and just not want to see me anymore, but that's great. We got 17 full days of experiments and a lot of data. So it was very nice set for several papers, for sure, but because this talk is called lecture lessons, well, this is the first lesson. It might work, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna use it. And I guess you might have figured by yourself why? Well, because of this. Obviously, it looks slim and simple and priced pretty accessible, but will you really right now wear it? If I would put it on each seat in this particular setup of the lecture, yeah, you might say, oh, it's interesting. We actually, I was even thinking to do this, but all of them are out running experiments. Just here in the setup, yeah, everyone wears it. It's just a setup for the lecture, that's cool. Will you actually wear it to each lecture setup you need to learn? That's another question, and I would believe that no. Maybe you would try it, maybe you would give it a try, yes, but not really wearing. And this is from this work, but a lot of people come up with the same thing. It's always a band that like, maybe helmet wide, etc. People design their own, like this is with Arduino, so it's like total and maybe in less than $100 for the whole thing, though it's not giving you the feedback. But still, the sticky electrodes in that case, in that case it's all flying, so there is no actual real-time closed loop system here. And obviously, not that it is unacceptable, but to be very honest, you're not gonna run for it uh, on Amazon or on Apple Store. And we thought, now as we have a proof, though it's 48 users, but we have a, a strong hypothesis that it might work for people. What can we do? How we can solve this problem? And as I said in the beginning, because we are looking at the signals that are coming from the head on the head, you need to look in this part of your body and think, what are you wearing? How we can mask this device? And this is the solution. 68% of Americans is having a pair of glasses. 64% are having a pair of a smartwatch. It's gonna change, I'm pretty sure, even by the end of this year, but this is the current statistics as for the December 2019. Glasses, it's nice, but as you can figure it out from what I mentioned in the beginning, this doesn't really cover the forehead. It doesn't have any kind of 
feedback, at least doesn't look like, no bracelets, no nothing. So how are we gonna go around this form factor? This is where another part comes from. If you have a form factor which suits, it doesn't mean that you're gonna actually ultimately use it. You might still be <laughs> in need to design your own upgrade to it. So obviously we didn't just go and said, oh, we have to really design our own. We went and to see what is out there. And there's a lot of things out there. This is a research prototype from Google from like two years or three years ago. It uh, gives you LED lights to indicate the direction where you bike. Okay, just research. Both AR frames, you might have tried or heard about those. It's augmented audio reality. Very powerful for a simple reason. You use 99% uh, of all the information on you with visual modality. So everything that doesn't use visual, I consider really powerful. There is Focals, they are slightly more expensive than Bose by 200, I think, but they just give you the information and they work with limited number of applications. So they are releasing a new version. There is View as well, it's, it's like Focals, so just like smart screen. But they just deliver information, they don't measure information. But yeah, there is something that actually can measure something. Something, that's exactly the good word. For example, some people said, we're gonna just attach the sensors. They took Google Glass, which is over 1500, and just they just attached some sensors to it. Uh, then there was Emotigo, it's a nice project uh, from several years ago, it's a research prototype. As you can see, they also took a pair of glasses and just attached the sensors. These sensors do not measure brain activity, but they measure the other activities that I mentioned, skin conductance, so basically stress and arousal. And also there is OptAlert. This is a model that, design, that is designed for drivers while they're driving, but the thing is that you don't see this on the images, that's how they put it. It's wide, wide pair of glasses. You might not also want to use this one to go to this extreme. And we found finally two that are actually much closer to what we were looking at. It's called Smith Focus and Jeans Meme. So they're both available. Uh, one is uh, selling for 300 and another one is for 600, non-research edition. So Smith Focus is actually having EEG, so components for brain sensing here, just where it's actually touching your head. So it's actually really good. And Jeans Meme, which is super interesting, it doesn't have any brain sensing, but you know what it has? It has eye sensing component. So we call this electroculography or EOG. And you know what it stands for? It stands for exactly the same thing as eye tracking as I mentioned in the beginning, except this one doesn't use any camera. So no camera to detect. If you look left, if you look right, nothing like this. You can use just electrical activity. Um, so that's very nice. As you can guess, from especially from the privacy concerns. It cannot pick up everything that's based on the light, for example, Pupil dilation, that example I gave in the beginning, this system will not pick it up. But literature suggests it can pick up up to 248 different features. That's a lot, and that's very interesting. As you can see, those actually look like actual, normal, slim eyewear that you are using. So, the problem is them, <laughs> that they are biased. They are so, so biased. What you need to do to use these two pairs of glasses is an application, an app. So you are trying to solve a tension problem using an application with notifications. That might not, again, be the way you would want to solve this problem. It is the way to do it. It's exactly what they are doing, especially with the jeans meme. They're trying to solve a tension problem, but you need to look in your app to know what's happening and in the stats. And obviously when you click on the app, it gives you this screen, so this is uh, the from an official screen, but then you will go and check your Facebook, your Gmail, etc. Well, you know how it happens, you know the story. So when we look, I'm not gonna go cover obviously all of the state of the art, we said, hey, what we can do to maybe solve this problem? So we said, what if we do our own pair of glasses, which will fit there, which will have sensors, but it will also have feedback. So it can measure your brain activity and actually eye movements because why not? But this is not a good explanation in science. It's very important. Because the sensors that we have right now are gonna be here, because there's only way to put it that is co close to the brain, you need to compensate for potential loss of information. You don't have any sensors on the forehead anymore. Where are you going and how are you gonna confirm what's happening? If you have additional modality, 
in a lot of cases it helps. And this additional modality of information, additional information is actually coming and might come from the eyes. And the state of the art definitely backed us up on this. So I'm gonna show you an example. So what happened is that we have this current prototype, current function prototype, we call it a tentative view, it's 2.0. And what it has is, it has as I mentioned EOG for eye movements, EEG sensors. It also has bone conduction feedback. So it's this point that I mentioned. Our glasses do not need any app to be run and to be used. It has a built-in feedback component that can actually be used directly by the user without any notification on the app. So it will basically give you sound feedback uh, or you can actually modify it on the firmware well, uh, level and it will actually give you a vibrate tactile feedback. So it will gently vibrate or give you a bone conduction sound. No one will hear it, no one will sense it except you, but it will give this feedback if you are zoning out. So we measure their uh, different uh, cognitive states uh, using the glasses, and then we can, if we need, use the feedback. So this is how the video looks like. I'm gonna just show you. So Jane, you are very discreetly. <laughs> it's the easiest way to get the consent for filming. <laughs> Another lesson, your users will always try to cheat, always. <coughs> this is another big problem, though it's not covered at all in this lecture. Uh, do not hesitate to talk to me if you want offline. Truck drivers, deliveries, tons of like spent today like I think 30 minutes because of the traffic jam like FedEx, UPS, everyone delivers all these boxes uh, but the life is not getting easier for them and self-driving cars are not arriving next year for sure. So we have done a lot of tests with this form factor. 
you also saw that there is a little like brush like so we still actually keep and have this option for vibrate tactile feedback and this is interesting i'm not going to stop on this but actually in our preliminary study with children some of them love auditory feedback when we use it but those who have ADD, ADHD, they love vibrotactile feedback. They hate auditory feedback. So this paper is coming out uh, soon, but it's just an example that even if you have a system, you still need to test it with actual users. And then they don't, they might not like your option, they might actually hate it. And you need sometimes to do personalization for the user. It's very important. Some people are very auditory. Some, strangely, are haptic. Why do we think it works? Ultimately, it's because first we try to position the feedback on the part of the body with which you perceive information. It's very important, meaning that then we're not sportsmen. We're not doing here the solution for sportsmen. Maybe one day, why not? But for the sportsmen, it might be go on the feet or on the hands somewhere. But you perceive information with your upper part of body. Actually, even I just been told that I'm even filmed here by this till just here. That's why we mostly focused on. So you would want to put the feedback if you're consuming information from this direction. Is it a video or one on one like right now? You want to put the feedback just still here. This is the first thing. Second thing, a lot of people said, oh, why did you even initially do this brush, this scarf? Well, first, as I mentioned, it's very important to actually unify your users. But second, it's habituation. For example, right now, I got like, I don't know, 100 different vibes here. And you know, I don't pay attention, like at all. I'm pretty sure right now, if you put actually EG on my head, nothing will happen there. Like, I just do not perceive it, which is normal. My brain blocks this out. That's why when you put the vibration or other types of stimulants, the parts of the body uh, that I actually not usually subjected to this vibration or other stimuli, it actually does work very well. You don't usually have something vibrating here. You definitely have sound coming here, like all the earphones that you're using, that's for sure, but usually not vibration. That's why we believe that it might actually work. And also why it's interesting, because you can change the patterns. Once again, it's habituation. You, your brain is gonna block it out. It might consider that, okay, this is actually a distraction. In, my, in some cases it might, especially when it was like random feedback for some users, but in the cases, if it's not, if you change the pattern, you will still have this signal coming out here. So we did all of this, and this is just another example. Uh, what we are trying, so we did, we did this, this is a published paper. So we did it with different t types of tasks, and we made users use the system online, offline, and mixed, meaning that offline, they actually could check their productivity. They can see, oh, I was actually really not attentive when I was programming or something like this. And right now we actually focus only on minors, so children eight to 12. Obviously they're not doing programming, they're not doing test and code yet with them. They're just doing reading and watching different videos that they're assigned. And uh, we are trying to see if the system can help them. And there are different, once again, testing groups because there is a lot of research behind the fact that you can use neurofeedback to improve attention and particularly as a way to lessen the ADD, ADHD, not to cure. No one is talking about curing here. Really lessening the condition. Huge body of research, but a lot of these limitations are the ones that I mentioned. The form factor. So basically, you want to lessen the ADD, ADHD. You have a, at least 15 nature papers talking about this with this population, just with this population. But you know what they ask them to do? They ask them to play video games at home. That's not a problem of the video game. You can have amazing setups there. The problem is that you cannot bring it to the actual environment where you might want them to get re-engaged. Here, for example. Doesn't mean that it's gonna work. Doesn't mean that you want it running for the whole day. We're gonna just talk about it as the next step. But this is one of the ideas where we try to bring what is already in the state of the art on the opposite from the solutions what exist and they are Mostly they are medical and sometimes, as we believe, they're just not needed. So that's what we are up to, but, and here comes just before, so we can obviously, we are focusing here on engagement, but we can also measure fatigue, cognitive performance, creativity, and perception and recognition. I'm not gonna talk about these at all, but these are the other ones that we can uh, use and we are using the system with those. Ultimately, what is super interesting is actually 
uh, engagement when they are engaged and when you are engaged. Like right now, you're gonna see at least like 20 more slides and we're gonna be about to wrap up. But there are definitely some that actually captured your attention. I can tell you, the ones that in the beginning, because you just came, you were super engaged, then your attention span went like low after 10 minutes. I mean, I can even draw you how your attention would look like through this lecture, because that's how it was even designed. But there are maybe some parts that actually really captivated you. Maybe you have one of those glasses that I mentioned. Maybe you actually also struggle well while you are driving because you do not live in Cambridge or Boston area and you need time to drive. These kind of parts, and that's what we are also doing within our uh, project with my Italy, is that what if we will tell the child afterwards, hey, you really were super engaged when you were listening about Eiffel Tower. Do you want to find out about other uh, monuments in Paris or around? So magnifying this kind of feature is of the interest as well. Maybe very, very powerful. We also have a lot of contacts from the teachers in learning setups. Because if everyone here is disengaged right now and you would all leave the room, you know whose fault it is? It's my fault, not yours. It's mine because I didn't manage to bring something interesting here so you would actually stay engaged and stay with me and actually want to ask some questions. So if this is the scene, and there are so many tools right now we are bringing to the classrooms, VR headsets, AR headsets, different learning setups, some might work, but some will not work, and this is normal. So it's interesting to figure out objectively which would not work and which actually are not, just not maybe applicable to this category of users or children or age group altogether. So there are a lot of interesting things we're testing here which I'm not, uh, because of the limit of time, able to cover, but definitely talk to me offline. And we did, as I mentioned, a lot of obvious tests. It was not only in learning setup. We definitely did actual tests with driving, safety at the factory, workspace. We have pap papers published, but here comes lesson two. I guess it's already lesson four, but it's lesson two. So you might face challenges in the areas you couldn't even expect it. And I guess here it's actually pretty straightforward because we are working with population, we are working with humans, and more importantly in this case, it's actually minors, so sensitive population. So it's a lot of ethical considerations that arise. Would we want to release this system one day? Right now, for example, the, everything that you see out published is using this EEG band, so the ones that you can acquire, etc. But we are very cautious about what we are releasing, for example, about the glasses, about the algorithms. Is it going to be open source or not? For just, just this simple reason, do we want it to be really out there? We want to share the research and the results. Whatever the outcome is, because we believe it's important, because of this very same reason I mentioned, it's going to be out there. It's not like, oh, one day, maybe. No, it is going to be out there. This is for sure, but exactly this type of devices. But are we ready yet? How should we manage it? And I can tell you that the biggest issue of all of this is not what we are facing and trying to, in our setup, work with teachers, work with ethicists from Harvard, with other people, uh, talking with parents, with children, collecting their feedback. No, the biggest one is an actual absence of law. There is no law right now that would limit me using your physiological data, there's consent and IOB and obviously, but this is ultimately for another like five hour talk, I think, but this is ultimately something that you might want to take away as a message. For the future of these devices, this is the big thing. And we definitely need to be in a bigger community to solve this problem. This is really a very important one. And this comes the last part of this talk and this is very important. It was in the case of the glasses. I'm gonna show you some personalizations in the end, but it's also in general, it should be fun, especially if you're talking about learning environments. Because everything I'm right now presenting to you, you know that you can actually ultimately call it already obsolete, because you know, it's already acquired knowledge. I don't like to call this obsolete, but you know, I need to, even if I'm the author of most of the things that you have seen here, because it's already acquired, it's already out there, it's already published, people know about this, it's already released, maybe something is patented, maybe not, but it is out there. The only way <laughs> to thrive is to basically, to get even engaged in this setup is to have more ideas 
and to push it further. But to push it further, sometimes, especially with populations that are learning environments, especially with kids, it should be fun. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And it should, believe me. And I'm going to show you why. It might be even working with you. <coughs> so who has seen Harry Potter here? Or read or seen? So I'm going to play you a scene. Obviously, this is the scene that belongs to our friends at Warner Brothers. Hopefully, it's going to play. Is it working? I don't know if you remember, but this is a scene that from the first movie that just arrived to Hogwarts, to the magic school. And uh, there is a sorting head. This is the ultimate thing that you need to use to get sorted in one of the houses. We don't hear very well, but that's not a problem. So the head basically tells him where he is and what are his or her, uh, in this case, his features. And you know what we did? We actually built one. <laughs> yeah, we called it the thinking cap. And this is one of the experiments that we did. We did a lot. So here we do seven to 17 years old, but I have people who, 75, who want to do it. It's a lot of people who want to try it. So the idea here, and though it looks fun, I would say, and I would argue, and I can show you from the paper the results, it works because it's sort in head. So what we're trying to do here, we try to improve self-esteem, motivation, and performance in children. So for the self-esteem in particular, we also focus a lot on the mindset. You might know fixed and growth mindset, fixed you are born as you are with the brain and intelligence that you have, and there's no way to change it. You are born, that's it, done. Or growth, it's the ones that you can develop, even if there's challenges, problems, you can develop your intelligence. You can actually build on top of your errors, on, on the challenges that you go through throughout your life. So what we do here is, Picture is pretty, uh, pretty dark, but we put another EEG sensing component there. It's not, it's much bigger in this case. So if you remember in the very beginning, I said, oh, depending on where you put the sensors, you can pick up different activities. So here we didn't want to really focus on attention and engagement. Here we wanted more. Here we want to detect what they're thinking about. Not mind reading, but basic imagery processes to classes. So meaning for non-scientists, Two activities. For example, you imagine a black cat and an owl, or you imagine dusk or dawn. It's actual examples from the actual sorting head ceremony, if you ever did it online. They literally ask you, think about an owl or a black cat. But instead, you just need to click through the screen, 12 screens, always binary, always two choices. They're usually very opposite. And in the end, the head will tell you, you are Gryffindor, or something like that. In this case, you're going to do it with the head. You need to think about an object, and the head will tell you with the help of the Bluetooth speaker inside what you're thinking about. I don't hear it, parent doesn't hear it, uh, the head talks to the child. We are very explicit also, no magic, we train the system beforehand, we explain like there is, we don't just, oh, hello, here you go, head, no. We, we have a very long explanation how this works, what it does, children have lots of time to ask the questions. We train the system, we actually specifically tell them, Think about like a chair. If it was not pre-trained, it's not gonna work. The system will never recognize it. So they're aware that it's a scientific tool, but they still show very interesting um, results. Basically, this is for example, the mindset. So obviously we had, not gonna go dive in these four groups, but we believed that we need to test all possible conditions. Let's say if you just have, again, just a head just a cool, funny scene, and maybe you are a fan of Harry Potter, that would work. We obviously just tested the EEG headset. Hey, you just have a brain sensing component, maybe this will be enough. You just have a talking head or not talking head. So there's different components and conditions to it to make sure that what we are measuring here, this mix of neuroscience, but also computer science, artificial intelligence, and also science fiction reference that is so, so famous, actually, is the thing that we are measuring. So it actually um, got significant on all possible combinations here. In task persistence, we ask them to solve the subjects that they hate. We knew this because we asked their parents what they like at school and what they hate at school. And then they told us. And we always were asking them to solve the problem that they hate. 
always on their level though. So meaning that if I have a fourth grader coming, it's I'm always having printed out task crumble math fourth grade, always. We're never gonna challenge them. There is a way to do this and we did other tests. We're gonna stay in their comfort zone, but we know that they hate the subject. So will they actually want to solve it? And ultimately, when I will in the very end ask them, hey, do you want to solve this problem, this set of problems, which is exactly one level uh, more complicated? They almost 97% always agreed to solve it. And what is even more interesting is that we had a condition where the sorting head was telling them, hey, let's do some math or let's do some reading. So the subject, different control subjects, but where we know that they like it or they hate it, and they were always doing what the head was telling them to do. And the thing is that it's depersonalized. So it looks like very personalized, it's ultimately depersonalized. There's no adult behind it. It's really about the child and his or her interaction with the system. But what is very important is that when we were asking them, why do you want to use it? Why it's interesting? Because they develop trust towards the system. Because the system can tell them what they're thinking about, even if it's not always right. They said that it's so engaging that they want to keep on going. And if it will tell them something new, they're really ready to work further. Task engagement, how they liked the subject that they didn't like at all initially. And obviously we had so, so, so many different setups. Uh, we had Darth Vader, we had Yoda. A lot of our kids asked for baby Yoda. Not a good idea to do this kind of stuff in December. Not a good idea. Uh, uh, Wonder Woman, uh, girls loved Wonder Woman. They loved uh, Captain Marvel. They actually asked me explicitly if there is one. Mini Mouse ears. It, it, it does move actually. Depending like uh, Iron Man, you name it and we had it. So it was a very, very heavy setup with a lot, a lot of kids and parents coming over. Um, and obviously here, I think it's very, the, we even did like public demos of the system. It's very important how it can actually bridge this gap to with ad tech. Not only with STEM, but this was adding magic to science, but also fostering self-esteem and empowerment because you can program for different messages. You don't maybe need the brain component, but it does help a lot in these conditions. So don't forget that the fourth is new, just here. And this talk was actually, this exact talk was two years of work, a lot of papers read, a, a lot of adults and children, and huge thank you to them for bearing with me and doing all the studies. It's a lot of demos, a lot of papers written and submitted and waited. One grant, thank you from Italy. And it looks like this and it sounds like this, but obviously it hopefully will be something like that. And just to finish here on the very uh, important note, I wanted to finish it with this. I built this for you, and someday you realize that it represents a whole lot more than just people's inventions. It represents my life's work, it's the key to the future, I'm limited by the technology of my time. But one day you'll figure out, and you'll do and you'll change the world. It is the work of my life. I worked for this for the past 11 years. I'm definitely gonna continue. But some of you, regardless if you're a student or not, might still get some inspiration in this talk or in some other talk, some other thing you will read or see. And hopefully this will actually change the whole world for the future. And you can start just with our community. Thank you for your attention. So uh, I know that it's four, so I, I see people running away. I don't know if this room is taken, uh, but if it's not taken, we can still hand it out, but if not, I'm still here. Yeah, the, the room is free till five, so maybe we can let people leave who need to. Yeah, if you need like yeah. coffee or water, leave, because yeah, I did it a bit more than I was planning to, but yeah, definitely feel free to leave, that's totally fine. And you can once again, if you're interested, once there to email me, ask for references, there is a lot of things from other people and of course it's very important. And of course, team behind the projects. And yeah, if you are some of your students, we are always interested in Europe. <laughs>
<laughs> so anyone has immediate questions? You have pressure? Yeah. So um, my bias is that, that when, when learners are not paying attention, it's the educator's fault. And I, I feel there is so much bad education out there. And just the fact that we, the standard for teaching is, you know, a monologue that goes on for 50 minutes. It's not the student's fault. So, um, it seems, I'm asking myself, are we applying the solution at the wrong point? Mm -hmm. For example, okay. you could imagine in residential teaching mm -hmm. that when the, when the students are failing to pay attention, it's the teacher who gets the, mm -hmm. and not the, yeah. not the student. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so that's one question. Mm -hmm. The other question is, do you know anything about the brain? Because some, I have, I don't know anything about this, but my sense is that, you know, the, the floating of the mind is actually important somehow. So, you know, if, if, I don't know what it is, you know, but, but when you mention certain things, I, it reminds me of things that, that, that I'm interested in and it sort of connects things mm -hmm. up. And it's important that, that I go off, my mind wanders off, Mm -hmm. and I process the stuff that's going on. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if we're losing a lot by pushing mm -hmm. the, the learner to pay attention when may, po possibly the more valuable thing is the mind wandering. Mm -hmm. those yeah. are, those are my okay, thoughts. so yeah, thank you for the questions. I got both of them, so I will start with the first one. So I totally agree, you should not blame the student. And there is no idea to blame the student and to see on the point. And I'm more than for changing of the tools. Happily, right now, I mean, I graduated a long time ago, but as far as I know, for this particular project, there's a lot of different setups in the classrooms. It's not 40, 50 minutes to talk, which is very important. Even in this setup, I should have maybe let you ask the questions, but I believe that because of this subject that may be pretty uh, new for a lot of people and because you are more adult so you can actually sustain yourself you should not but definitely you cannot change just one side and it's in any project this project other project like i literally cite in all of my papers one paper and the title is it's okay not everyone is good at math so this phrase was told by a teacher to a uh, 12 years old and then he came back home and it was also told by his parents and what you know he started doing arts and etc. but because he believed that he is not good in math because someone told him. So it's very important to understand that I was also teaching and I'm also teaching. The thing is that there are both sides. There you cannot change one and then hope that there will be floating of this positive energy towards the other one. But I see very positive movements, at least with children, like this kind of setup that I mentioned, even as they are researching. Actually, parents and teachers are excited to try them out. They have time, they actually can have time without ruining the whole curricula to integrate it, to try it out, not just for research purposes, but really try these kind of things out. And it, it is actually very powerful. And I see so many different, different things that I couldn't imagine, both for assistive tech classes, where there is really a need to design tools that are very accessible, cheap, easy to break, not dramatic if they're broken, to more sophisticated meanings that like yeah, more HMDs and all this kind of setup. There are definitely advantages and different, definitely drawbacks. The thing is that, and I think uh, my PhD is in neuroscience, we are having extremely limited abilities with our brain once we uh, get to a certain age. We are not developing easily, and this is normal. The only goal of your brain is to preserve your life. That's the only one just the only one all the rest it's another thing but you just need to, it just needs to keep you alive so it's very important to understand that in some cases you might want a boost because the boost might help you in conditions that are maybe medical maybe you're just not aware and then it's ultimately up to you to decide if you want to use it or if you don't want to use it so in a lot of cases we actually use it with adults and with teachers in this, some cases we use it with minors, but we definitely need to include everyone in the loop here because you cannot just say, 
oh, we design it for this population, and that's it. I mean, you don't, you don't go to any other stakeholders. That's not going to work. So you need to see the whole loop. It's very important. But you definitely need to have the tools. But you know what? The tool doesn't mean that you need to adapt it. If you have a tool, and I think I was very clear to in this lecture, it doesn't mean you need to go run out and VR hat that like, Two weeks ago, I was in San Francisco. I was presenting uh, for a conference that is AR, VR, because I do a lot of AR and VR with brand empowerment. And that was Facebook. And they were presenting uh, two VR headsets. You are watching the Super Bowl in VR headset. My question was, why would you watch a Super Bowl in the headset with your friend? And you know what? The whole room was whispering the, the, whole, the same question, meaning that if you have something fancy, it doesn't mean that it is actually the use case, even if it is released by a billion company, because maybe they didn't figure it out yet. Doesn't mean that the people who developed this is bad or they have bad vision. No, it might be just not the use case. Infrastructure-wise, most of these headsets, for example, they're still B2B, they are not B2C, for a good reason, because of the applications. There's no killer app for that HMD, and they're still figuring out killer apps for this. So I think it's very important just to take it, not solely the solution, but who will use it on both sides, how it can change both sides if it can, and ultimately, who is there, what is the market? And not say, he, telling about the selling, it's really, do you need this out there? Or if you're just creating tech for tech, that's gonna bring you nowhere. And the second one, mind wandering, totally agree with you. Uh, it is powerful, and there's tons of papers that says it is powerful. But there is also tons of research said that when you are staying in mind wandering too long, in a lot of cases, it can be detrimental to attention, performance, and cognitive development. So once again, tons of papers, you need to figure out, it's literally whatever you pick is gonna be the one you're gonna push. You can see in my reference, and I'm happy to share. There's a lot of research telling that mind wandering is important. Of course, consolidation for memory, I agree with you. When I was showing something, you might have thought, oh, this is the thing. So then do, you, do you interrupt the moment the, the mind begins to wander, mm -hmm. or do you let the student No, we let the student. For five seconds or oh, of course, oh no, no. Yeah, of course I didn't go into all these depths. It's 15 to 30 seconds, and we will, we will never like, if it's just consolidation. Yeah, so just to make sure that we are very clear, I went it on a very high level to talk about this, but there is way, I mean, you train the system, it's personalized for each student, because the way, for example, just because I'm good in math doesn't mean that he's good in math. I need one second to solve the problem. You might need 15, and we're gonna figure this out. That's exactly how we do. Train for each kid. For example, if I'm tired today because I'm just like, because I just landed from San Francisco, you cannot really expect high performance from me. The only high performance you can expect is from very trained populations like uh, sports, sportsmen. I work with this population like with Olympic champions. They can go and go in some conditions, but they cannot also go for the whole day, and this is not the idea. We know that it's gonna mind wander. For example, when you are learning the system in the classroom, what we have done in the very beginning, first 10 minutes, the system is fully off. I mean, it records your brain activity, but you know, you just arrived, like you saw it, you just arrived, you grabbed your goodies, your water, you talked with your friends, you chatted, you're like figuring out, does this worth my time, and this is gonna be like, eh. Yeah, this first 10 minutes, you do not need this. And you know what? It not only applies to this talk, it applies to all the talks. If you made your feet up to this room, it means that you were interested. Or you were in need, if you're maybe a child, that parents pushed you here, you were on this bus, you came here, and you're still gonna figure out, you're gonna be engaged. After 10 minutes, this is an average for adult, oh, then we're gonna start looking. So the design behind, we try to really figure this out, and that's why we need to work with teachers, because like this 10 minutes, that was my idea, purely because I know how it is, but it doesn't mean that I know every possible setup, and that's exactly why, because I also don't know each possible user for this setup. I don't know your, how tired you are, I'm not gonna maybe administer your questionnaire, are you jet lagged? Did you have any substance use? Substance use, you're gonna delay, like, cannabis, alcohol, it's gonna delay all your responses by a minimum seven seconds. That's why you should not use them while driving because seven seconds is actually seven longer than it should when the accident happens. But it's also gonna delay your mental uh, capacity. This is no secret and this is exactly why you need to always 
have this kind of training set up, it's not one fit all solution. So that's very important, of course. So mind wandering is very welcoming, very powerful in some conditions, but a lot of research, a lot of conditions say that too much it could be sometimes not good enough. So that's exactly why we are figuring this out. That's exactly why we are not pushing this. It's like, okay, we have this 100 devices ready to go, ship to all the schools in Boston area and greater. Yeah, so that's like the same. But I'm ready to also happy to share references. Yes? In the first chart that you showed, yeah. even in the best case of, of feedback that was targeted mm -hmm. to get attention, the average was around 50%. Yeah. Is there any sense that there's too much attention that's unhealthy or either maybe just a diminishing return that, that the difference between 0 and 10 attention and 10 and 20 starts to be smaller? Yeah. You know, is 50 enough for an instance? Yeah, exactly. So basically what happens, and you can check this in the paper, but I will just give you a very short, brief outcome. So, it's personal so basically when I say personalized, it's really personalized, meaning that Maybe your scale is not, so everything that I have shown is on the scale 100. Because it's a classic scale, it's easier to compare with state of the art, it's also easier to compare among the subjects. But as I just said to the gentleman over there, is that we do it personal training. So each of the users went through the training to basically figure out what is your scale. Because my scale right now, it's, and for you as well guys, it's like 4 p.m., depending if you are early birds or not, might be pretty tiny, you might be actually lower, and it's normal because you're getting tired as well. So your scale right now will be different from your morning scale. So we adjust and readjust in real time. But we, I'm showing the results that are actually for the whole class or set of students. That's why you see 50 and 100. But in some cases, most cases, it never reaches 100. Just because your scale is not 100, your scale may be 1 to 48, and that's your scale, you know. And actually, 48 for you might be 84 for me, or opposite. So basically, we have a set of formulas and that we apply to the data to make sure that what we present is also meaningful, stays meaningful to others, but also we are not uh, brushing out some results from actual personalized training. Yeah, so that's very important. It's also another good point. But I agree with you that, you know, you cannot have too much attention, actually. It, it was interesting. They're trying to see if we can induce the total amount of attention. So throughout the day, it might be slightly more than last week or two weeks before. And especially it's interesting when we take the device away. Because our idea is not to get you a new iPhone that you're gonna like sleep 24 seven. The idea is that if you have, or your family member or someone wants to improve attention for the driving or for the learning or for some other use case, what will happen if the device is taken away? Our hope is that and that's what exactly what we are testing right now, that's why actually in this project we are using fMRI as well, is that it hopefully is gonna just improve, and once the device is out, you're still gonna be on this improved scale. You're not gonna be hopefully need to use the device, at least any time soon. You might, if you feel like, and if you want to, but not in the need, not like, oh, I need to click on here, I need to have it. If it improves and it stays in place, that's what we are testing right now. That's basically, it's a gain for us. Any other? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, because I, there is a slide saying that um, the, like attention, attention mm -hmm. so it can measure different things like yeah. creativity, cognitive performance. Yeah. So I'm wondering how do you use like EEG to measure creativity? Oh, it's actually, we did this project, with, we just submitted this project with EEG over there. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, um, there are different form factors, and I just mentioned that I actually went to talk to San Francisco. So, creativity is something close to the thinking cap. So, what we have designed is imagine this pair of glasses. Like, I, I guess I can even pull the slide out if you're interested. But we embedded this in the VR and AR headset. The same thing, you know, it's easy, it's a HMD, no problem to embed it. Like, it costed us three hours on 3D printer to reprint a block to st stick it inside. And that's it, literally three hours and very few money to get it inside. And what we have done, imagine you are wearing an AR headset and you're gonna think about an object. It's the same thing that thinking cap works. But here, the head is talking to you and telling you what you're thinking about. Over there, you're gonna see the object in front of you. We call this what you think is what you get instead of what you see is what you get. So this, People who tried this interaction scored in creativity much higher. And imagine that you can use this in future for 
like Photoshop on other applications. It's not that here. But imagine you will think about something in particular, one feature, and it will appear here in front of you. So this is how we basically do the creativity task. For the perception and visualization, it's different. Uh, it's visual and auditory attention. You might know a cocktail party problem and two people talking to you at the same time. You're definitely going to pay attention to just one because it might be more interesting. So it's the same principle, but uh, it's actually in the form factor of the glasses fully. But it's basically we're going to stream two streams of audio to your ears, left and right, and we're going to ask you to pay attention to just one. So this is how we do it. So it's, these are different applications, but we use these tests, and then we have score how much how creative you are. So how your answers to the questions of creativity, the test that we developed not by us, actually change. And yeah, how your just general perception changes. So the glasses doesn't actually measure like creativity. Yeah, there's no yeah, there is no <laughs> no signal in the brain that will like creativity. Yeah, uh, yeah, there's actually not a lot of signals in the brain like this. They are usually very precise. There's no creativity, no emotions, no stuff like this, no. There's a lot of responses in the body that might we can pe picture, but no, it's not that you can measure. Neither with EEG, nor with other brain imaging techniques, but there are actual ways of measuring it with response times, with a lot of tests that others developed. They might be biased, but they're good, at least right now in the literature, in current state of the art to be used, and that's what we are using, yeah. Yeah, it's not like, Oh, oh, now you're definitely more creative because you blinked three times more. <laughs> no, that's not how it works, unfortunately. And definitely developed uh, further and further, so yeah. Anyone else who has any questions? Yeah. So MIT does a lot of work on active learning and yeah. appears to provide feedback. Has yes. there been any attempts at integration? Uh, of uh, integration of uh, with this project. So right now what we are doing is we are integrating, actually what we are doing, we are doing home use with children because we really want to, and that's exactly the point that I mentioned. Before we release whatsoever or even like test of any integration, even with adult students who are 18 plus, we really want to make sure that it does what it does, not gonna be overused in some strange ways. So right now there is no, we don't think about any integration right away because we're really very cautious about ethical concerns. And actually right now what we literally finished is a new uh, form factor. So it's still glasses, but what we have done is we basically add uh, more protection. So computation is done on device only. If you try to bridge it and use the data against someone whatsoever, it will just send some random sequences. Basically data starts being completely unusable and we actually developed fully new algorithm uh, we, which we do not publish. And I don't think we're going to actually release the algorithm before we'll actually make any active choices about the system itself. But ultimately, as I said, our goal in particular of this project is like my research interest is does it, do you really need it once you use it? Because what we are doing right now with the test, we're going to use fMRI with children. We want to see if there's a difference actually uh, using fMRI in the brain when they're using it over six, eight weeks. Because if there's a difference, they don't need the device. Uh, so I yeah. I was thinking more along the lines of yeah. the person we guessed last mm -hmm. week where yeah. we currently have proxies for how much confusion yeah. the class had. Yeah. Pro profile of that confusion. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, but once again, it's, it's definitely possible and it's definitely would be easier to adopt like 18 plus, at least from my ethical concerns, but definitely we need to figure out all the ways, you know, to, it can be good and bad, and generic metrics for sure might be of the interest, but who should have them? Students? Should we, sh like, share them with, like, Dean saying, like, hey, this class doesn't look good, like, because then it will be used against the teacher. So ultimately, which might be the solution, but uh, sometimes, you feel that uh, you would want to somehow share this information, you just don't want to speak out loud. It might be a way to share the information. Hey, just check how engaged or disengaged I was, or confused because the person was talking about on the lecture about something that they were not supposed to cover at all in the subject or behaving inappropriately. That's definitely interesting, but before we're gonna even do this, even with the test group with adults, there's a lot of discussions actually to do it for teachers in training. So with like, uh, like in this kind of uh, setup, because we have like one in Cambridge, supported by MIT, obviously. This, yes, so because they do it with adults and their teachers in training and they use different, like VR, they literally have one week VR, one week they use their and they have like different 
cards. I'm not. I, I don't remember the name of the like the, some game like playful cards. Uh, don't know the name of the thing. So and they actually want to see how people were responding. So this actually I believe is much more reasonable immediately because we have a huge demand for these ones. And the way just to figure out these ones, I believe that will be better port of entry and like better setup potentially because then you can actually see objective results. Any other questions? Thanks again. Yay!